Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Lovely to see you all here tonight. Um, we continue our studies in the series, Sermons That Shook Society. And tonight's subject, as you'll see from the first slide there, is shaking sectarianism. Uh, we have read Acts 10 together, and that is certainly going to be uh, the main scripture that we will be looking at tonight. But before we do that, I want to direct our thoughts to another passage in the Bible, which deals with the very same topic. Ephesians chapter 2 and 3 are very helpful in this matter. So I'm going to read to you selected verses from these chapters. These chapters in common with Acts 10 are all about the fact that the Gentiles, that is those who are not of the nation of Israel, the Gentiles are included in the blessings of the gospel. This was a huge shock to, to Jewish communities all over the Roman world, as we shall see. So here then are some verses from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Remember, he writes, remember that at one time you Gentiles were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, that is Jew and Gentile, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both, Jew and Gentile, to God in one body through the cross. For through him, Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you Gentiles are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, the Jewish believers, and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This mystery, writes Paul, this mystery was made known to me by revelation, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, what the Apostle Paul has just explained to us in theological terms, we are about to see happening in real time in Acts chapter 10. And we need to understand right at the outset that this was a huge issue. To say that it shook Jewish society is no exaggeration. The events of Acts 10 divide themselves quite neatly into four main sections. One, the vision given to Cornelius. Two, the vision given to Peter. Three, the gospel preached to the Gentiles. And four, the Holy Spirit given to Gentile believers. So first of, all, first of all then, the vision given to Cornelius. And we find that in verses 1 to 8 of chapter 10. We've read it, uh, Jeanette's read it to us already. We're going to read it again, verses 1 to 8. At Caesarea, there was a man named, named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household. 
gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, that's three o'clock in the afternoon, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. In this count, we see a number of factors being worked out together. Here is a genuinely devout Gentile believer. He is a believer in the God of Israel. Although not a Jew by birth, he has become a Jew by profession. He lives out his faith and he makes it openly known because we read that he fears God with all his household, and that would include his family and his servants and the soldiers whom he commanded. He also gives generously to the poor and he prays to God continually. He is an example of godly living. But if he has to find salvation, he needs more than this. And God, who he continually prays to, is about to reveal himself to Cornelius in a new way. His prayers and his godly living are about to bear fruit for his eternal blessing. And in all this, God takes the initiative and sends an angel with a very specific message. The message could have been a direct revelation of the gospel, but God has more than this in mind. He is going to reveal the gospel to Cornelius, but he also has lessons to teach Peter at the same time. The Lord is going to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. So Cornelius obediently sends to Joppa for Peter to come. He doesn't know why he has to do this, and he has no idea what Peter will say to him, but he obviously believes that God has a message for him through Simon Peter. Secondly, the vision given to to Peter. We read about this in verses 9 to 33. Um, It's a long reading, but let's read part of it at least. Verse 9, the next day as they, that is the men whom Cornelius had sent, The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance, saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. The passage goes on to explain how the men arrive from from Cornelius, explain why they're there. Uh, And Peter, we read, invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends another example of how he openly uh, displayed his faith in God. 
uh, he tries to worship Peter when he comes in, and Peter says, no, I'm, I, I'm a man, don't do that. Uh, he said, God has shown me, uh, he, he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And then Cornelius again relates to Peter the vision that he had, and he says to him, so I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So as Cornelius was having his vision in Caesarea, 40 miles away in Joppa, Peter also has a vision from God. He is at prayer. During his prayers, he realizes that he is hungry and asks for some food to be brought to him. While waiting for the food, he falls into a trance, which is obviously induced by God, just as his hunger surely was, because in this trance, he has a vision of food but not the kind of food he was expecting to be brought to him. In this vision, he saw a great sheet descending from heaven, which did indeed contain food items, but items which repulsed Peter. A voice said to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But the animals, the reptiles, the birds in the sheet appear to have been of the unclean variety, things which Jews were prohibited from eating. And he responds in the typical Peter impulsive way that we might expect. No way, he says. No way. By no means, Lord, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. But God is not really teaching Peter about food in this vision. He's using it to prepare Peter for his visit to see Cornelius, which Peter at this stage knows absolutely nothing about. The vision of the sheep and the animals, the reptiles and the birds is repeated three times before it is drawn back up to heaven and out of his sight. And this emphasis and repetition, I think, illustrates the cultural issues which were so embedded and entrenched in Judaism and which Peter was still struggling with. However, Peter gets it because when that visit to Cornelius does happen, Peter has finally understood the vision because he says to Cornelius, we read it a moment ago, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. The lesson from the sheet full of food was not that Jews were clean and Gentiles were unclean, Rather, it was that both Jew and Gentile are unclean, both are sinners, who need God's forgiveness and the gospel wonderfully, as we shall see, includes both. Thirdly, we see the gospel preached to the Gentiles in verses 34 to 43. Now we get, once again, because Jeanette's already read it to us, but we get to read the sermon which Peter preached that day to Cornelius and his household and friends. This is a gathering of Gentiles, and to them the gospel is now going to be preached. This is the sermon that shook Jewish society. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. 
You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both of the, in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone who believes in him. In the Old Testament of the Bible, the Gentile nations invariably only merit mention as they come into contact with Israel. In general terms, they do not figure greatly in the Old Testament narrative of God's purposes. There are a good number of exceptions, of course. For example, there's the story of Naaman, the Syrian military commander in 2 Kings chapter 5. This Gentile man had leprosy and was cured of it through the testimony of a young Israelite servant girl and through the ministry of the Israelite prophet Elisha. His reaction shows in embryo that the purposes of God did not exclude the Gentiles. 2 Kings 5 and 17, Then Naaman said, From now on your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but the Lord. There is also the case of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. He was a Midianite. Listen to what it says in Exodus 18 and 12. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Then there is the remarkable story of Ruth, who was a Moabite. Not only did she come to trust in Israel's God, but she was an ancestor of King David and is even included in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus himself. Remember her words to, to Naomi, her mother-in-law, in Ruth chapter 1? Where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. These examples and others show that the Gentiles weren't beyond the reach of Israel's God. And they were pointers to the future inclusiveness of the gospel, which would come to all the world. But nothing like the full extent of this inclusiveness was revealed in the Old Testament. Only in the New Testament do we learn the detail and the full extent and width of the gospel. In fact, the true state of Gentiles is summed up by the apostle in these chilling words which we read earlier from Ephesians 2. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh were separated from Christ, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, you were strangers to the covenants of promise, you had no hope, you were without God in the world. But now, through the gospel, all this has changed radically. Even for enlightened Jews, even for the disciples and Jewish believers in the early church, the extent and scope of God's blessing on Gentile people never entered into their thinking. 
Gentiles were still very much second-class human beings. R.T. Kendall, in his book, The Thorn in the Flesh, has this to say about these times. Listen to these words. In those days, every Jewish man thanked God daily that he wasn't a Gentile, that he wasn't a woman, and that he wasn't a dog. This ought to give us a pretty good idea why the revealing of this mystery, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus, why this was such a big deal. It was radical in the extreme. It was a huge shock to Jewish society. Had it just been that the overflow of gospel blessings to Israel was of benefit to Gentiles, that would have been easy to accept. Had it even been that Gentiles could tr truly be saved through faith in Christ and become something like associate members of the church, thus keeping the cherished distinction between them and Israel, that too could have been acceptable. But it was hugely hugely different from that, far deeper than that, much more far-reaching than that. Now, Gentile believers are on exactly the same footing as Jewish believers. They have the same standing in Christ, the same relationship with God, members of the same body, fellow heirs with the saints. The revealing of this mystery now clearly showed that whatever advantages Israel may have had, and they were great, and however much God loved them and wanted to bless them, and he did, the full picture was much wider than that. In fact, the very reason that Israel was favored by God was so that the blessings of the gospel would come to the Gentiles. This was what was so hard for Jews to understand and accept. To now learn that in Christ there was no difference between them and Gentile believers was a huge leap for them to make. Paul even goes to, as far as to say in Galatians chapter 3, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. The distinction no longer exists. Now the New Testament uses different metaphors to explain the inclusiveness of the gospel to both Jew and Gentile. Now perhaps the easiest to grasp is that the church is depicted as the body of Christ we read about this, don't we, in 1 Corinthians 12? For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. And that's exactly what we see happening in our fourth heading. The Holy Spirit given to Gentile believers. We read about this in verses 44 to 48. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, that is the Jews, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What we have here is a kind of Gentile Pentecost, a very clear sign from the Lord that the door to salvation 
through the Lord Jesus, was wide open to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. The Jewish believers were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was given to the Gentiles also. They would have remembered very well what had taken place with them. It's recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now they were seeing it in a Gentile setting. This is what shook Jewish society, especially among the Jewish Christians. This was amazing to them. And for some, it was difficult to accept. They were God's people. They were the nation he had made covenant with. This was a completely unexpected turn of events. The Gentiles were now able to have the same experience of salvation in Christ as they, the Jews, had. And through their faith in Christ, to have exactly the same standing before God. So what are the lessons for us from all of this? What application of it can we make in our own lives? Well, first of all, when we see all this, when we become aware of it, when we understand what it all is, we surely must stand in awe of God's plans and purposes. In Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul, writing about this very same subject, the Gentile inclusion in the blessings of the gospel and how they are grafted into Christ, the source of all blessing for Jew and Gentile, he concludes chapter 11, a very, a very deep, a very comprehensive chapter about this matter. He concludes it with these words. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. We stand in awe of God's eternal plans and purposes and how in his wisdom he brings them to pass. But secondly, the inclusion of the Gentiles in the gospel is good news for the whole world. It's gospel news. It means that everyone, anyone, can know salvation. There is no one who cannot experience salvation in Christ. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And this remains the case today as much as it did 2,000 years ago when God spoke to Cornelius through Peter. It's true for us here in this building tonight, 14th of July, 2024. It's true for you if you're watching on the live stream in your home tonight. It's true for you who might be watching tomorrow or next week or even years from now. Until the end of this age, until Christ returns, it will be true that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So where are you tonight in all this? Where do you stand, whether Jew or Gentile? 
Is Christ your Savior? Are your sins forgiven because Jesus died for you? Have you repented from your sin and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ who is the only way to God, the way that is opened for all who trust in him? Once again tonight, the offer of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ is laid before you. It's for everyone. There are no boundaries of any kind. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So we urge you, we plead with you, believe the gospel message and turn to Christ even this very night for salvation. As we close, listen once more to Peter's message that shook society. This is the gospel proclaimed to everyone. This is the third time we'll have read it tonight. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death, by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and caused him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Will you join me as we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that in your word the Lord Jesus is revealed to us as the only saviour of sinners, the one mediator between God and men. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that your word is clear that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Father, it is our prayer, it is my prayer, that everyone who hears these words tonight will truly know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, the one who died for them, the one who rose for them, the one who will come again for them. So, Father, prosper your word in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. And may your great and glorious name be praised and honoured in all that we say and do. Help us to please you in the way that we live our lives, we ask. Thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.